So uh, I'm just uh, here to talk about uh, a contract that we had on uh, Lewis Cross City that just involved uh, collaborative element to it. So I'll just run through where I'm going to go with this. So uh, I'll give a brief description of the project and the contract that's the subject of the case study. Uh, just go into our reasons for choosing a collaborative contract, uh, our implementation approach, what the issues we found, uh, the key findings and outcomes, uh, some recommendations uh, from our experience, and then just leave you with a final thought. Uh, so apologies for people who are familiar with the project, but uh, Lewis Cross City, uh, basically uh, a light rail, so it goes from Stevens Green through the city centre, through uh, Louis uh, campus at Grange Gorman, uh, out to an old uh, abandoned railway line, uh, out to uh, a new depot at Broombridge. Uh, so basically, the total route length is 5.6 kilometres, uh, which is about 13.3 kilometres of single track. So six kilometres of that is off street from Broadstone to uh, to Broombridge. 2.1 kilometres here in the uh, for tram stabling, and about 5.2 kilometres through the city centre. Uh, so I suppose we've done a, a few of these projects at this stage, and they all actually follow the same uh, sequence. So we, we go in and we do the enabling works first. So uh, we do some heritage works. There are Georgian cellars all over the city centre. We go in, we move statues, we fill in the cellars, and then we go, one of the most critical contracts is we move all the utility works out of the way of the, the tramway. Uh, then we go in with the main infrastructure contract, we put down the tracks, the overhead lines, any structures, uh, substation buildings, uh, the depot itself, and then it's a follow-on contract for mechanical, electrical, uh, the power supply, the systems, and then we have testing and commissioning at the end. So the, the, the contract that uh, is the subject of this case study is the utility works contract. So basically, as I said before, uh, we have to move all of the utilities out of the way of the, of the tramway, so that involves us constructing new infrastructure outside of the tramway diverting cables into that and then decommissioning the old infrastructure. So on this particular contract we had 70 kilometres of new ducting and pipe work. We had two kilometres of sewer, old, sewer relining old Victorian uh, sewers which had to be strengthened. We constructed 50 new deep drainage manholes, so, so very deep manholes in the city centre and we had uh, huge amount of building connections. So I suppose <coughs> to go to the reasons for choosing a, a collaborative Form a contract that you're probably all familiar with. Uh, this famous quote. Uh, it's not the first uh, Lewis contract we did. We had the first two lines, we built three extensions. And we've had the exact same problems with this form of contract all of the way, uh, or this contract, not the form, this particular contract all the way through. So basically, we have huge amounts of change on this contract. It's, 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 it's underground. Uh, the utilities are never in the place you think they're going to be. They're deeper, so to the left or to the right. You don't know what sort of traffic management you're going to get. You're interfacing with uh, the public, the bus uh, people, the, the, the businesses, everybody. Uh, you've contracts before and after. You've usually, unfortunately for us, we have a fixed end date. So we've published when the passenger service is going to start, and we have to start at that date. Uh, so everything compresses. Uh, the contractor really reluctant to respond to all of this change because of the uh, time it takes to agree costs of the change and the adversarial nature of the contract. Then you've gone through all of that, you get to your final account and you've no comfort on what that final figure is because you've done a deal or else you've spent years in dispute and then maybe you have a bit of comfort because somebody else has told you what to pay. So uh, I suppose what we did was uh, we went and we had a look uh, and we got permission to consider a different form of contract in this instance and there was some uh, I think there was some political desire to do that as well. So we looked at various contracts out there. We chose the NEC 3 option C. So again, lots of people are probably familiar with this, but for those who aren't, it's a cost reimbursable contract with a target. So uh, the contractor specified the target at the end, but then the contractor gets paid whatever it costs. And at the end, uh, based on the difference, so if the contractor's final account figure is below the target, he, he gets a share of that gain, and if it's above it, he has to share in the pain of it. Uh, 
we didn't we had little or no experience with this type of contract before, so we engaged consultants to give us some advice on what to do. Uh, but we actually implemented it fully ourselves so that we want them to train us rather than just go in and take it over. So we would have the experience going forward. Uh, all the senior managers got training to tell them what, what would be involved. We sought advice from the industry, so we went to the UK, talked to transport agencies over there and various other people. But most importantly, I think from my point of view, is we actually took the advice we were given, pretty much everything people told us to do, we did. Whereas, you know, a lot of times people can be very selective on what they actually uh, advise they take. One of the things, the, the things I'm glad we did was we were advised to introduce a project management or administration software. So they said this particular form of contract is very onerous from an admin point of view. And they told us there was this software out there that would basically handle all the communications on the project, uh, submissions, things like that, change control, uh, deadlines. Uh, uh, it would be hugely helpful. So we did that. We trained all of the site staff that we had uh, on this type of contract. We briefed and trained the contractor as well, actually, uh, and got them, encouraged them to do their own training down through the chain. But most importantly, I think at the end, was we actually put in place people who were open to this type of approach. Um, so, uh, the main issues that we, we encountered during it, uh, the contractors just weren't used to this type of contract, so uh, it, it was very difficult to change uh, their behaviour. Uh, again, a, a topic that's come up with a lot of the speakers, uh, we, we were, I suppose, a bit lucky on this contract where the main contractor did a lot of the work and then subcontracted it, but there was no follow through with the, the next tier of uh, the supply chain. So, on, on, I'm just imagining if you have a management type of contract where you have a collaborative form of contract with the main contractor, there's a lot of subcontracts, you really don't have a collaborative form of contract at all. Uh, uh, it wears off, uh, so we found that after a while, you know, we started off great, everybody was friendly, and then you would encounter problems, and people were just reverting to, to their old behaviour uh, at periods during through the contract. The contractor systems don't support this type of approach, so his communications, his organisation, the hierarchy of the structure, they, they don't support making collaborative decisions. Uh, they didn't have uh, skill or experience in this type of approach generally. And they were very, very reluctant to release commercial information to us, even though it was mandated in the contract. So there was a lot of work on NDAs and all sorts of trust building exercises just to get uh, what was mandated under the contract. There was a penny drop moment on the contract. It was very, very late in the end. But even that had its own challenges because we were working all the way through the contract in a certain methodology and then the contractor, I think with about six months to go, or four months to go, okay, yeah, finally got the whole concept of uh, a collaborative contract and completely changed tack as to how they were carrying out change and submitting compensation events. So it was interesting. Uh, and one of the takeaways, the key for me was is that uh, I've heard it a lot of times is that it's only a contract. A uh, collaborative contract can be administered in, in an adversarial manner just as easy uh, as with an adversarial contract. So, so it's the key uh, findings that we had are the outcomes. Uh, for us, it, it did exactly what it, we thought it would. It did exactly what it said in the tin, as the Rancio man would say. Uh, the contract was delivered quicker than uh, our previous experience. The contractor responded to change uh, in a much better way. Uh, the issues were resolved more efficiently and collaboratively on site. If we took a snapshot of a similar period on that contract and a, and a similar contract previously, there was much more resources on site because he was happy to direct resources to work because he knew he'd get paid for them. So overall the works were carried out more efficiently. Now I know uh, David uh, uh, a lot of people need people have been talking about cost savings. For us, uh, it, it wasn't cheaper. It was more expensive, but it wasn't cheaper. But I, I think, not directly anyway, I, I'd imagine that indirectly there probably was lots of savings because the project was delivered, or the contract was delivered much uh, quicker. But I suppose from my point of view, I wouldn't like to be promising cost savings uh, using this form of contract. Uh, 
because they don't necessarily follow in some instances. But it, it was a much better uh, contract to work on from an atmosphere point of view, better relationships, just overall more efficient. Uh, so I suppose my, my recommendations are our recommendations for what we, 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 we would say going forward. Uh, one of the things we, we, we thought was quite interesting is, is that you know a lot of people expect people to act in a certain way, uh, but they don't necessarily tell them how they expect them to act. So one of the things we thought was quite interesting, uh, we saw it abroad actually in, in, in Denmark, was they had a, a project or a contract charter. So they actually wrote it down. We, we did it in a more informal way on the contract where we just kept talking about the same things over and over again. We had about three sentences or four sentences that we kept repeating. But we, we like this idea, we only found it out towards the end of the contract where they actually wrote down what outcome they're seeking from the approach, what the priorities are on the, con on the contract or project, which you don't ever see sometimes, you know, where on this particular contract we wanted it done uh, within a specific period of time with good quality. Though that was the most important thing for us, whereas on a lot of contracts I've worked on, uh, I wouldn't necessarily know what the client was, you know, was concentrating on. They just say they want everything. Uh, you outline what way you're going to behave with the contractor and what way you expect them to behave with you. So basically it just describes what a good job would look like while it's in progress. And in Denmark what they've done is they've made this short and snappy, they put it up on a poster and they had it all over the site. And it just constantly reinforced uh, what way people were supposed to behave, which I thought was quite interesting. It's a bit touchy-feely for, for uh, some people, but I, I thought it was an interesting approach. One of the things we found was that, uh, I mentioned earlier, we started off really well and then uh, behaviour had fallen off. So what we instituted was uh, uh, an audit from a, a specialist company to come in and do a, a review from everybody to, to get confidential, to, to get their opinion. Uh, and that got things back on track and we did it sort of uh, informally ourselves during the contract. Uh, I know Neil had been talking about, uh, I was interested to hear that there's a more formalised structure in, in the UK. Uh, the other thing would be to try and ensure that the supply chain and the subcontractors are signed up to the same conditions. I know that can be uh, done uh, on a mandatory basis on uh, the NEC. We didn't do it, maybe something we'd love to do in the future. The risk reduction meetings were huge uh, from our point of view, which is where you know issues are raised very early and targeted without worrying about uh, contractually who's responsible for them. And similarly, program much more than any other job we'd worked on. Uh, they were hugely focused on. Uh, and the other thing then was to be reasonable with the risk transfer. And my experience, even though I work on the client side, I, th I think it's uh, <coughs> definitely the risk transfer is not reasonable in most contracts I'd see. And, and another thing is to operate the contract as written. So a lot of the times when we've talked to people, they've said that they write time scales uh, in these formal contracts, but don't obey them. And you get out of shape and it's very hard to get back. And the last one then is, is to use that PM software. We, we, we were considering not doing it. We, 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 we uh, weren't really comfortable with it, but we did. And I think if we hadn't used this project administration software, we would have been in huge, huge trouble. So if, if, it's, if some people are thinking of it an option, I, I'd say it should be mandatory, really. Uh, so just a, a final thought, I suppose, which is, is kind of on the, on the flip side, really, which is if you can operate uh, a collaborative form of contract in an adversarial manner, you should be able to operate an adversarial contract in a collaborative manner, which is kind of what Louis was, was uh, talking about. Uh, so if you're not in the advantageous position to, to get a collaborative form of contract or you're not using the, this uh, framework overarching, the things you could do to make maybe make everybody's life a bit easier. So. Uh, the first thing I suppose was contractor sele selection. Uh, I was kind of horrified when I looked into this that I, I thought uh, price only contracts, uh, tenders were, were pretty much gone. David probably tell you they're, they're not, they're hugely around. So I suppose it's the quality price uh, debate really in using the, the, the meet criteria. And then shortlisting, not using open tenders. Again, I'm very surprised by how many open tender. Uh, competitions are still around. The reasonable risk transfer, uh, 
one of my hobby horses, I suppose, is unforeseen ground conditions. Uh, you know, where the, 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 the client spends huge amounts of money doing SI and then transfers all the risk onto the contractor who doesn't price first, so when something comes up, there's a huge uh, claim. The risk reduction meetings is something that we are trying to introduce on GCCC forms of contract where we have a process where everybody leaves the contract at the door and just tries to work out what the best solution is very, very early to problems. It, it, it's quite difficult to, 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 to do, but uh, it could be hugely useful if you, if you can do it successfully. Uh, and then cash flow. I, I, I'm kind of amazed that it, 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 it's a huge issue for contractors and subcontractors. And under GCCC, I suppose it's a two month payment period, really. And we, we've seen that in some places that can be done as quickly as one week or two, two weeks where an organization could turn around and payment that quickly. Uh, and we've certainly done it on some contracts where uh, it, it, it's been possible and it's been a huge help to, to contractors. It's something I, I, I maybe advise people to look at. And then retention bonds or advance payment bonds if they were going to be suitable to the uh, contractors. Uh, I talked earlier about the project and contract charter, maybe to consider it. The other one is, is the project management software. It's talking, talked a lot about with collaborative forms of contract, but and then it's been specifically written for NEC in the UK. There is actually a, uh, a software that's available for GCCC forms of contract that will basically allow you to do just what it says in the GCC form of contract, manages change control while your communication submissions. So maybe if somebody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll give them that detail if they don't know it. We're using it on the infrastructure contract for the Lewis Cross City project, and it's, I, I couldn't imagine not using that. We, it's our policy now to use it on all public transport uh, contracts, and we're trying to implement it on roads contracts as well. Uh, another thing then is, is the program. Uh, it, it, it's a huge focus on NEC three contracts. I'm not familiar with the other ones from, from the UK, but much more so on GCC, and I think it, it, if you could keep the program short, for example, on, on Lewis Cross City, our, our contract program is, I think it's 160 pages long, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, what we did was, we had a similar contract on, on, a similar program on this contract, and we reduced it to 12 pages, and we could actually manage it much, much easier. Uh, and the last thing, I think Deirdre talked about it, uh, as well, is that, I suppose in my experience, I've, I've used a lot of different forms of contract, and everything as far as I'm concerned, really boils down to people and relationships. Uh, uh, and, and again, it's, it's, it's putting the right people in place with the right attitude, uh, developing relationships with the other side, and, and managing the contracts on, on that basis. Uh, that's it. Thank you.